Thanks a lot for that very, very kind introduction. I'm, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. And today I'll be talking about robot learning by understanding human intelligence. So when we talk about learning, when we talk about learning in computer vision, we are, or natural language processing, we think about broad, large, and diverse internet scale data sets for training. But when we look at policy learning in robotics, very often it is on a handful of objects in a handful of training. And this is for good reason. Uh, sparse robot RL is challenging. You need an expert to actually demonstrate what you want the robot to do. But teleoperating robots is both slow and efficient. Um, and of course, there are practical considerations of taking a heavily physical machine outside of lab to actually tell it. So the question that the field is focusing is facing right now is how can we scale up robot learning? Uh, and such, right? And over the many last years, uh, many answers have arisen. Right. People have uh, thought about using self supervision for scaling of robot learning. That takes the expert out of the picture. Uh, you can collect data in parallel across multiple different robots. If you want diversity, you can start taking and put robots in homes, or you can uh, build capture devices which are practical to take around and collect data. One could also do so. Now, while each of these has its own uh, limitations, uh, what I'm going to focus on today is how can we scale up robot learning by observation of other agents interacting with it. Why might this be a useful thing to do? We do as adults. Uh, I can look at other people uh, uh, solving tasks and I can actually learn from it. But crucially, this is a very important part of uh, child development. So this is a quote from Alison Gopnik's uh, popular uh, book, uh, Gardner and the Carpenter. And what she says is nearly all animals, even slugs, can learn about the world through trial and error. Smart animals such as crows and primates can also learn by observing others. As we have seen, human children take learning through observation and imitation to a whole new level. They use imitation pervasively to figure out how the world, the other people, and their culture. So this is kind of the backdrop. We are interested in learning through observation of other animals. In particular, I'm going to focus on egocentric behaviors. Uh, this is purely uh, for, uh, I'm not taking a uh, philosophical stand that it has to be egocentric videos, I'm just working with egocentric videos because they have a few desirable properties. These videos can take the form of uh, agents navigating around in their apartment. So this is a video uh, actually taken from YouTube where someone is uh, trying to show off their uh, luxurious home so that they can sell it to someone. Uh, so there are egocentric videos which show navigation. Uh, but there could be also other kind of egocentric videos such as this one where, uh, you know, uh, people are cooking uh, cooking in kitchens uh, and doing things. Right? So this is the setting we have. We have these kind of videos and we want to learn something about how can robots learn. Now you might ask, why would such videos provide any kind of signal for me to learn uh, anything about robots, right? So let's think about how can egocentric videos aid in, aid, uh, can help robots learn something. The very first factor is there is large diversity. You have Lots and lots of I mean, videos can be captured much more easily than taking a physical device outside and uh, doing it. You can just mount it on your head, you can uh, collect data. So there's large diversity, which may provide good generalization. If you happen to be lucky and you find videos of people solving the task that you are interested in, you actually get demonstrations for how to solve the task, right? If you're into uh, opening locks and so forth, here is a video that uh, is found in ego 40 dataset. It's going to show you the different uh, steps that are involved in opening locks. Uh, you know, show you that this is how you can do this. This is how you can. There's yet another latch kind of thing that you're opening, and so on. So, if you were interested in exactly this particular task, and if you find a demonstration, you are in luck. You don't need to discover the solution which reinforcement learning algorithms have to do. You can, in some ways, have a very good prior for what to do and the things you do. You might not be so lucky. You might not actually see the exact task you're interested in. But in those situations, videos still depict what the world is like and how it works, right? So if you're looking at this video, you immediately learn, okay, there are things like things that can open. There's a handle. You kind of approach it, uh, approach the handle. If you open things, you find more condiments for cooking. You may not be interested in this task right now uh, or uh, and, and such, but this fragment of behavior might still be useful. Right? Or you can actually, you know, learn about the what is called unknown unknowns kind of thing. Like this person, when it's like trying to do this task, this wire got entangled somewhere, and you know, this person demonstrated and can lift this thing up, take the 
uh, cable out and go on with the task that way, right? So there is like lots of things which are difficult to speculate what you can learn, but there's a lot of this information in rich, broad, diverse data sets on the internet or uh, video data sets that are not Now, this is the promise, but it comes with its own challenges, right? Learning from videos is not so easy uh, as such, right? There is the foremost, there's embodiment gap, right? The sensors, actions, and capabilities that a human has might actually be quite different from what you have, right? So you need to be aware of this gap. Uh, videos don't come with action labels. No one is labeling what, uh, how, how am I moving my end effector in these videos? I'm just going about doing things, right? Uh, so they, they don't come with action labels, which one needs if one is someone is doing imitation learning or anything. Uh, the goals and intents of people are not. I don't know what the person is going to do or like, some kind of interruption is going to come upon and how is this person going to recover? None of these things are needed. Uh, depicted trajectories may actually be suboptimal uh, and, and, and so forth, right? So there are many challenges that come about in thinking about using videos for learning. At this point, you might wonder that this is maybe a lost uh, cause entirely. Uh, and this is kind of where, uh, uh, this is how we have been thinking. In machine translation, uh, and then the key idea is learning at different levels of abstraction. In machine translation, you have source text that you want to translate into target text. And this is a figure from a popular machine, uh, uh, natural language processing textbook. And the key idea over here is that one could think about translating at different levels in this uh, in this uh, in this triangle. One could think about translating at the interlingual level, which is you take source text, you map it into abstract meaning space. There's no translation that needs to be done in the meaning space, and you can just render it out in the target text. And this requires large understanding of the analysis process and the generation process, right? So this is the flow in this diagram from all the way here, up and then down. But you can actually also think about machine translation in a more direct way. So there's direct translation. Uh, so you build like a, you translate word by word or phrase by phrase, you take source tests, you uh, do it, uh, you, 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 you do translation. And over here, you don't need too much analysis of, uh, you know, how, you, what, what meaning was represented over here, but you need a large amount of transformation. You need a lot of paired data in terms of what, what in one language means. And of course, you can do, you know, translation uh, somewhere in between. So we're going to take motivations from this, uh, uh, this view in NLP and think about the control hierarchy, where I'm, at the very bottom level, I am interested in, you know, uh, human actions were a result of muscle tensions, and robot actions are essentially going to be results of motor production. But there is all of this hierarchical decision-making process that the muscle tensions arose due to some macro actions I was trying to execute, which are part of some skills, some sub goals, some goals in the world. And, you know, you can essentially have the same triangle. You have human behavior analysis on one side, robot behavior generation on the other side, uh, and so on. And uh, depending on the amount of gap you have between goals, what you can see, uh, what we can uh, and embodiment, we might benefit from translating at different levels of abstraction, right? So you may not necessarily want to go from here all the way to the top and all the way to the bottom. That will actually defeat the purpose of this whole enterprise. Uh, and but you also don't need to directly map from muscle tensions to motor parts. There could be there are many paths to this triangle, and it may be beneficial to think about different paths uh, for the right? So what this talk is going to be about, I'm going to show you some examples of paths we have considered in this triangle uh, for navigation and manipulation problems. I think for navigation, we have a much better sense of what it will look like. For manipulation, a lot more has to be done and uh, I'll present some in-progress uh, thoughts on that. Okay, so let's start. So let's I'll talk about navigation first. So what do videos tell us about how we can navigate, right? So I'm going to argue uh, videos quite directly show where can you go from here? Right? So let's say you have this particular video sequence, um, right? If you saw this video sequence, now if I give you the first frame, you can actually infer that you could go straight and then turn left into the scene. You're not exactly observed this, but you have a very good, I mean, you have explicitly observed this, and this is an inference you can start making from the video. So we can start answering this question, where can you go from here? Right? I'm going to add that we can actually also learn about uh, how spaces are laid out and uh, for semantic navigation tasks, right? So let's say I show you this other uh, video snippet, uh, right? And if I were to ask you the question, uh, given this image, where would it be likely to find the couch, right? Now again, you have kind of seen the future over here and you know that, okay, 
going forward and then turning right would be a meaningful place to find. Right? So this is, you know, what is next to what uh, videos shows. So I'll talk about two uh, papers which uh, kind of get at this, and this is a little bit old work, but I think we should talk. So here is uh, here the sentence. I have these videos. Um, they don't come with action names, as I said, right? So that's kind of one problem to deal with. The second is it's possible to do multiple different things and intents are not more different, right? Um, and we tackle these problems by uh, action grounding by an inverse model and by jointly mining uh, intents using a latent view. So let me say more about that. So if I have um, a robot, I could build an inverse model. Uh, and the inverse model is as follows. I take a robot, I execute random actions, I get IT, AT, IT plus one, AT plus one, and so forth. And now what I can do is I can train an inverse model, which takes an IT and IT plus one, and tries to predict what action led me from IT to IT plus one, right? So this is an inverse model. Inverse models are nice because they're not long size and you are just taking into account what was before, what was after, and trying to say what action. So one can learn this in a reasonably sample action, right? So you can train this, and you know, uh, for navigation, that's not only we are doing this, you could also do structure for motion, and that can also be uh, Now, once you have this inverse model, you can take this inverse model and run it on the video that you have. And now you can actually label this video with the actions that you do this. And now we are in business, we can start doing policy, right? But this is where the second problem comes in. Right. So if I have this video and I train a policy which tries to output the action that it took, you have a problem because in the very first image, you could have gone to trade or you could have turned right into the loop and you probably don't know which, which behavior you're actually doing. And for that, what we're going to do is we are going to look at what happened in the future. So we are going to look at what actions were executed and I'm going to compress them down into a latent intent that the robot was trying to execute. And I'm going to condition my policies on this latent data, right? And, uh, and, and, and so that's kind of what I'm going to do. Uh, and I can actually also train a model which can predict the latent intent from the, uh, from the image that I have, right? So I can set up these kind of losses and I can start training this model. Now, uh, yeah, so all of this is actually only used during training. What I get at the end of the day is these things which I'm calling subroutines, which can take in a latent intent and the current observation, and it can output what actions one can take to exhibit a useful reasonable skill. A second model you get from there is the supportance model, which is essentially where you can invoke a specific subject, right? So you get these two models. Oh, sorry, what do you mean by the affordance here? Yeah, so affordance in this case, I'm mainly, uh, I have, so, so specifically, this is a latent, uh, this is a discrete latent intent. Uh, so I essentially have in this case, let's say four subroutines. Uh, the whole is not to see which of these four subroutines are actually you can invoke at this particular point. So, should I think of the intent as the value function? The intent is not the value function, it's a discrete variable in this case. It's, it's essentially a, you can think of clustering the different, different behaviors I have in this data set and it's one of each cluster. It's not quite a value function, at least for obvious reasons. Yeah. Is there an intent condition only on the action or do you take it? So uh, in this version, we were only doing images. You could have also done with uh, images, but we, we were only taking it into it, uh, actions. Actions are Yeah. Right. Sorry. Okay, good. Um, so this is what we have. Uh, so this is a subroutine that got learned from this kind of uh, enterprise. You have a subroutine which appears to turn right. Uh, it can, you can initialize it at different locations in this kind of hallway, and it can actually uh, exhibit consistent behavior of turning right into this room. Uh, on the bottom, you're seeing another subroutine, which is turning left. Uh, and it's actually at the same location, you can execute different subroutines, but this subroutine can actually also be executed at other locations where turning left is uh, This is some output of what does the affordance model write like. So this is for the subroutine one, which likes to turn right. And in all of these locations, you can actually reasonably expect to turn right. There is a, there is a, this is a, four, this, this subroutine is actually afforded at these particular locations. And the similar things you can see for the subroutine. Now, what this lets us do is purely by watching offline uh, uh, video, videos, we can actually, we have learned subroutines. What we can now do is we can just use these subroutines as is for exploring an environment. So, what we are doing here is we initialize the operator at a place, you execute the, uh, you use the opponent's model to sample the subroutine, 
you execute that subroutine and then you keep doing that over and over again. And what you can see is this leads to much better exploration of the environment as opposed to other skill learning methods which are not using uh, videos in any way. So there's diversity is only the curiosity uh, of the papers at the time in your university. Uh, so as this, you can actually use these for effective exploration. You can actually also do task-driven reasoning with this. You can set up a hierarchical policy, uh, which it has a sub-policy, it has a meta-controller. You initialize the sub-policy using the opponents, uh, the subroutines, and you initialize the meta-controller using the opponents model. Uh, you have to do some things to also feed in the goal specification, but that's a detail. And now what you can observe is you can actually learn much faster uh, with this initialization. So because the model already knows good behavior, it just needs to figure out what sequence of that composition of that will actually get into the task, and you can get uh, improvement in sample efficiency required in task. Right. Okay, so this is one example of how we can use videos in order to learn what to, uh, what can I do in this rotation and how. Right. Okay, so 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 that was one aspect. Now let me talk about the second aspect, which is can we actually also learn uh, semantic priors for environments using videos? And so this was uh, some other work. And the problem statement is again, I have egocentric videos of the form I'm showing you here. What I'm trying to learn is essentially semantic cues for efficiently finding objects of interest. So, uh, for example, in this case, let's say I'm at this restaurant, I'm trying to look for a bathroom, uh, you know, going straight and turning left, maybe a relevant exploration uh, to do, and that's kind of uh, the, the kind of semantic cues you want to do. Right? Okay. Now, again, uh, this has the same challenges as we had before, uh, right? So, I'm not going to talk about it again. But in this case, an additional challenge that comes about is that depicted trajectories may not be solving the task you want to solve. Right? These videos are put online for people to show up their apartments, not to find shortest paths to specific sites in their uh, in their house. Right? And for that, we're going to use a standard tool in uh, in reinforcement learning, which is we're going to do cue learning to to distill out optimal behavior from suboptimal behavior. Right? This is a this is. A, this is a famous result from 1989, one of my most famous results in this uh, space, and that kind of what we are looking at. So again, we have the same thing as before. We have this inverse model that we have trained. Uh, we are going to label things with actions, and we are going to do this thing called cute learning, which I'm not going to, going to go into details, but it lets you learn a, a Q star of S, A, which is the optimal value uh, Q value function uh, that if you're in state S, taking action A will lead you to uh, fastest to Right. So let's see how do we use this. So this is called uh, VLD, value learning from videos. I have videos, uh, IT, IT plus one, IT, uh, uh, and, and so forth. I'm going to do action grounding like before. I'm going to run this inverse model, label it with actions. And I'm actually also going to do goal labeling. Here I'm just going to run an object detector, train on this uh, data, uh, and train on internet data, train on Google data set. Uh, and I'm going to get what objects are visible in this. Now, once I have this, I can set up these for purpose for doing you learn, which is IT, the action item of AT, IT plus one, what image did I end up at, and whether there is a reward in this case. And reward over here is being targeted as did you did your object with this one, right? So I can get Q learning for uh, purpose this way. I can do Q learning with this, and that actually gives me a value function. Sorry, I'm doing Q learning, I'm taking max over A. So then I essentially get this value function, which is uh, if you have uh, in the state, how likely are you? Uh, 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 for seeking objects in the world, right? So this is what, and, and here's some intuition for why this one. If you have this video, uh, this is three frames from this video. If you're trying to look for a couch, if you're in the third image, life is pretty good. You see a couch already, things are pretty good. If you're in the second image, things are actually not so bad because you kind of see the couch and if you were in the second image, you can actually quickly get one. But I think the interesting thing happens is that even in the first image, where you don't see the couch, you can actually still say that this is not so bad a location because to find the couch, you can leverage this cooperance that uh, that this television is kind of shared. If I go towards the television, I might end up seeing right? So this is under the hood what's happening with uh, when, when you're doing queue learning on this kind of data set. Uh, and that's how one might be able to learn uh, mine for these spatial cooperance is right? So this is what the learn value function uh, looks like. So value function is essentially going to measure nearness to goal. So it predicts, uh, it, it, right? 
So, so this is the final one that you are exhibiting right now. I'm going to, to show you the output of the value function for finding different categories uh, starting, standing at this current location. So what you will see over here, and this is all learned on uh, videos. What we'll see over here for finding chairs, couches, and dining tables, it is saying that, okay, this going somewhere in this direction is actually a good thing because you kind of already see, so it's not so surprising. So in this case, we are actually not, we haven't done anything substantially. But what I find more interesting is, even though you're not seeing a bed or a toilet, it is saying that this direction is actually more promising for you to go than other directions, likely because in indoor uh, homes, uh, you know, bedrooms are not kind of in the living area, they are probably off uh, to the side. You take a hallway and then that's how you just use it. So, for the core, kind of, uh, it's implicitly there. Right? It is implicitly there. So, it doesn't require seeing two objects in the same scene for you to establish a core current So, I think Q learning doesn't say anything that sort, but I think that's kind of what has to happen for this function to learn something meaningful. So, if it's two objects never seeing the same picture, you probably won't associate them or? Yeah. So, if two objects are, I mean, I, I mean, or you can give it also be delayed, so the learning could okay. slowly spread out. So I think this is a another picture which uh, one can see after training. What ends up happening is I'm computing the value function at different locations, and the value function is high close to the dining tables. But as training progresses, this actually smoothly right. Right. Okay. Actually, goes in the same line. I mean, for this is somehow is constrained to the like two rows. Yes, and, and, and this by itself is not sufficient to solve the problem. How do we use it is what I'm going to talk about. So uh, the way we are going to use this is we are going to embed this value function into a topological navigation stack in order to do the navigation, right? So there's a high level policy which decides where to go next and image a short term goal. There's a low level policy which executes uh, uh, which which executes uh, which uh, executes actions to achieve this short term. The higher policy is realized using a topological map, which is building a representation of. Uh, so, in this environment, this is the location you have been, this is the location you are at right now. <laughs> we are going to speculate that, okay, in the different directions, this is the likelihood of finding out, right? So, what I'm showing you here are the value, pre value predictions from each of these panoramas, and this is how likely is it to find the target in one of these locations. Um, at inference, what you do is you find the most promising direction. Use that as a short term goal and take a step in that uh, and, and sample it. Right? And I'm going to show you comparisons why doing this actually makes it, uh, causes it to work out, whereas the naive way of just using the panel. Yeah. C is class. Uh, C is class, yes. So when you're learning these two functions and from them, the you know, inferring the V star, you're, you're actually only doing this as a function of the current observable. But you would imagine that in the navigation task, what you really want is to keep a memory yeah, of exactly. the past observation. And you're kind of implicitly doing that in this high level policy. But the Q function itself is actually not doing this. So like you're not operating on the you're operating operating on a partial observation. Yes. And your learning, the Q learning is actually not really explicitly dealing with it. Yes, the Q learning is not dealing. I mean, yeah. The, 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 is, that, is that somehow problematic in the way that you're it might actually be uh, something in our favor, perhaps, okay. because the distribution is going to change. If you just did behavior cloning on this data, yeah. it actually does not work out as well. Yeah. Possibly because you take detours which are not useful. Yeah. But but yeah, but your understanding is absolutely correct. Okay. And I think it might be something that we are benefiting from. It does lead to some other interesting things that you know, if you're in a video, you saw a bed and then you looked at a wall. And then you what went past. Now you're saying that looking at balls is balls are likely next to bed mm -hmm. right? So now you will anywhere you see a ball, you'll have so this is like perceptual latency being something. Yeah, yeah. So it suffers from that. Uh yeah, we don't have a solution for that. Right. Okay. Good. So um, yeah, so this is an iterative process. You get the data course, you use uh go to the path panel to actually compute uh, actions, and then you uh, execute this action and compute. So here are some results. Uh, what I'm showing you is the FPL, the Oracle stop setting, which was not so bad. Uh, so that be as well. Um, and what you're uh, what I'm showing is so higher is better. So what we're getting is 53 percent uh, Oracle stop SPL when you train our model on YouTube and test it inside of Habitat. So in this case, we are actually suffering from a real to sim syndrome. Yeah, we are training on real data, but we are testing on simulated data. 
Uh, even then, that, that's actually doing much better than uh, if you think about strong baselines here. So behavior cloning. If you just do behavior cloning on this data, it actually we were doing uh, something like percentage BC. We are taking the goal no, goal locations and and even that actually did not work very well. At twenty four, you could do behavior cloning plus RL, and that also did not uh, help too much. Just RL also did not work. For us, the strongest baselines were essentially handcrafted things, just do blind exploration that gave you the second best, uh, third best performance, or detection seeker, which is well communicated fires, B9 for me. Right? But you can actually see some benefit from 56 to, 50, uh, 46 to 53 in terms of leveraging these. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, let me bring you back this picture. Uh, I'm going to, what, I'm, what I did in this work is we learned something from videos. And then we used a handcrafted policy to actually render out the data. And this was quite sophisticated. It was built in a topological map and so forth. And what this led to is good performance. If I instead did no hierarchy, if I directly tried to map from human actions to robot actions, and in this case, by using this inverse model, they would not show you know, uh, off from each other. If there was no hierarchy, that actually does only 15 minutes. So this topological uh, wrapper around it was actually contributing to the performance work. And this is an instance of transferring at the appropriate level for abstraction. Okay. Uh, now, this what I showed you as a as a general solution has two shortcomings. One and both were pointed out already. The trans uh, the transitions must be labeled with an inverse model. And in situations, you could argue that the inverse model might not be uh, well defined, or the human and the robot are just being so differently that that doesn't work. A second thing is that we're using something quite task specific. And in fact, that task specific thing ended up being useful for learning uh, uh, from this kind of thing. So there are these two limitations. And you can think of this machine learning question purely, which is can you intelligently, can you infer intelligent behavior purely from undirected observation streams, ST, ST plus one, RT? And if so, how? Uh, we have some work on this at IPF, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, I mean, the, the result is not very exciting, so I'm not going to talk more about it. I'm going to instead focus, shift on, talk about manipulation. How can we do manipulation? Uh, how can we leverage the same machinery for doing manipulation tasks? Right. Um, okay. But before that, if there are any questions on what I've spoken about so far, um, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. So you, when you use the new learning to find, did you uh, face any issues with things like maximization bias? Where yeah. The new learning, the, the values are overestimated and. You go to that point and you don't find the couch or whatever. You do, you do, you do run into this. If you look at all of these values, they're actually quite high. So there is the maximize the, the optimism bias over here. The reason why it does not bite us as significantly is because of again this uh, this high level thing. You can go there, you don't find it, your object detector doesn't fire, and then you know, okay, I want to explore for you, right? So this again helps uh, quite a bit. That's also actually the reason why uh, this thing doesn't work. As a right, like uh, like this, this this uh, no hierarchy reason. It's actually also part of it that you know you keep feeling, you keep coming back to the same idea over and over. Uh, we were using vanilla Q learning over here. We were surprised that we did not have to use any of these conservative Q learning, any of these offline Q learning me offline methods to improve Q learning. Uh, partly we think because of the diversity in the data. Right. I think if you're doing things with real videos, maybe the solution space is nice. We don't know, but that's a very good question. All right. Yes. Uh, I have a question for uh, this navigation task. Did anyone uh, now with the advance of like large generative models and all these two D priors to explicit model the environment? Uh, for example, you have first observation. I can really generate you. Yeah. Several possible rules. And I can do some kind of open vocabulary segmentation in this room to find the objects. Has anyone seen this? I, I think there have, there have been works, I mean, including uh, ones at Penn, which have looked at that kind of like using generative models to speculate what the remaining environment is like and go from there. I think that's a very legitimate uh, modeling choice right now, given that generation works so well. I think when you're doing this in 2020, I think my wisdom at that point would be would have been that. You cannot synthesize, you cannot extrapolate beyond the environment in terms of actual pixels. What we're extrapolating in terms of is likelihood of finding an object, which is what the value function is. But now I think it's a very, very well placed question. Yeah. I think the question, in my view, would be what data do you have to train the generative model versus what data do you have to learn? 
whichever one has more data, I will go. All right. Um, okay. So let's transition to talking about the manipulation. And uh, I'll admit I have less to say over here, but uh, but but we'll see. I think this is a harder problem. So for manipulation, I'm interested. I mean, the problem to think about is interactive objects. I'm trying to interact with objects. What do I need to understand about the object when I'm looking at that? In this uh, picture, which I've shown before, it would be useful to figure out what are side shaking right? So cupboard handles are those things. Uh, another useful thing to think about would be how do I interact with these sites? So using an adapted uh, thumb glass. And another thing, question is, what would happen if I actually do it? Right. So in this case, you know, this thing will actually open up. There will be more condiments inside that I can use. Right. So this is the this is what one would like to be able to understand from videos. You know, in order to do something, do some manipulation. Now, interestingly, answers to all of these questions are revealed if you just let this video. Right. You can actually infer that uh, you are going to interact with the cover handle. You can infer what kind of hand grasp would leave this to work out, and you can actually see what will be the result of this. You have all of these things that are visible in this video. So the key uh, intuition that we are going to build up on here, we are going to learn through egocentric observation of human hands interacting with it, right? So that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, so hands in egocentric videos are informative. Attending to the hand localizes where the action is happening, right? So you don't need to find where the action is happening. You can follow the hand and that kind of where the action is Hands show uh, where all you can uh, interact and see. And analyzing the hand might reveal aspects about the environment that uh, you are interested in. Right. So the way I interact with objects, what kind of hand pose or hand cast I'm using, might be indicative of what can I do with that. Right. So analyzing hands reveals information about objects, their states, and how to do. So let me show you how we have uh, done these different tasks. So the first two I'll call opponents learning, which is again, what can you do and how? Right. And we are going to create data for this using all the shell models. So we are going to take a model which can detect hands and objects of interest uh, and objects of interaction. So specifically, we are using this particular uh, work. Um, and we can actually also train models which can predict some properties of the hand. For now, I'm using a glass prediction model, and I'll try to relax this as we go. Right. So in this case, it's a good mapping task. Uh, you take this now. What you do is you. Uh, I mean, this is good. We have the we have the uh, we have the input, but we also have the answer right in the right way you're seeing. So the way we deal with this is we just delete the answer and train a neural network to predict the answer given the object, right? So the answer was in this patch, we are going to delete that patch and we're going to pass it through a neural network model, uh, which is going to try to predict where is the hand in this location and what kind of a grasp is it exists, right? So that's kind of what we are doing. So this becomes self-supervised in that manner. Uh, it's shell supervised in the sense we need a model to be able to, uh, you know, do this detection for us. Okay. So you can uh, do this uh, simple process. This is the kind of uh, output you can get. You can actually, given an input image, you can actually localize sites for interaction. Uh, you can figure out that, you know, the sides of plates are more likely to be interacted with, uh, you know, little things like uh, draw handles and so forth are, uh, are sites where typically interactions, right? So quite easily, we have been able to pull this information out, uh, out from the right? Uh, we, we, we actually collected a data set for doing this kind of evaluation. So this is uh, Mohit sat down and carefully looked through lots of lots of different kitchen videos and labeled what places are people interacting with and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and what we are seeing over here is that uh, uh, that mask architecture actually on the benchmark that we developed, uh, because it's trained on over a million masks of handled objects and so forth, it works quite well. But when we combine it with uh, with our method, uh, you actually get better performance than, than, than that. And particularly, uh, if you look at performance improvement on objects which are not included with the Coco data set, you actually get larger improvement. Right? So, uh, so Coco has objects like bottles and plates and so forth. So it naturally works quite well. You can interact with, uh, with bottles and such. And there's no preference in, you know, I can pick up a bottle almost from that table, right? So for those objects, it ends up being the full object as such, but if you have non local objects, then you have more interesting things, and that's the most where you see more. Okay. Do you do you get any weird effects from the fact that like some portions of the hand are not actually like, in included contact. in your masks, or like some not the hands, like the arms are still visible and things like that? 
So yes, that so to a... that is a problem. Uh, I think that is what motivated this aspect of cropping it on the bottom. Oh, okay. Right. So in egocentric video, there's mostly the hand is coming from the bottom of the patch. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, but now uh, we I'm going to talk about something that we have done to fix that. Okay. Just to yeah. Right. Okay. Excellent question. Uh, all right. So this is uh, this aspect. Uh, we can actually also have uh, these grass flavors. Uh, you can actually learn, do this kind of learning. You can actually predict what kind of a grass can you interact this object with. And this is the parallel extension grass that you can actually execute on this, uh, or like a precision depth grass that you're trying to pick up this particular object, uh, and so forth. Right? So this is, again, uh, an instance of uh, where can you interact and how can you interact. Right? So, so, so the masking was while the object is being interacted, or is it continuously uh, in the pipeline over there? It's actually we are subsampling frames where the hand is in touch with the contact. I see in contact. Yeah, we are we're doing the contact classifier also being part of this. Uh, okay. So this was about the first two things. Let me talk very briefly about uh, the, the aspect about learning more stage. The way we are doing this is instead of just looking at single frames, now we are actually going to look at tracks, right? So we can run this model, a uh, hand and object detector models, over to the video sequence. And I can get the object of interaction. I can get a track for it. I can actually get a track for the hand. I can actually also characterize whether the hand is in touch with the object, in contact with the object or not. Uh, and I can actually also characterize how is the hand moving around the object in 2D. Right? All of this is 2D. And again, that's a limitation. And I'll try to fix it going forward. Right? So how is the hand moving around, uh, around the object? And this is again, as I said, 2D. So it's like, how far is the center of the hand with respect to the center? Right? And what grasp is the hand? Okay. So I do all of this. Now, essentially, what I have is I have tracks for objects and I have tracks, corresponding tracks for hands. And now I can essentially do uh, some sort of self supervision. And we are calling this temporal symmetry with object hand consistency. And if you're familiar with uh, symmetry, this is as simple as you have objects, you have object tracks. And okay, the goal is I want to learn objects as state sensitive features. Uh, the way I'm going to supervision for this is I'm going to say that two frames which are close in time are likely to be in the same state. So those should be close together in the feature space. And they should be far away from uh, further out object crop and cross from other objects. Right? So this is you know temporal symmetry. I mean it's a temporal extension of symmetry. But we are actually also going to use object hand consistency. And the insight over here is that if the object that I'm likely to interact with objects in the same state with the same hand right? <laughs> So the way we are doing this is you take the hand track and the hand motion, and which is corresponding to this. And we essentially say that these features, the features that you're getting from here, should be close to the object features. And the object features will be far away from a different hand somewhere else. Right? So we are calling this object hand persist consistency, and a full model is the new component. And so we have some data set that we again collected for uh, evaluating state sensitivity of features. And these are comparisons with uh, resonant style models and such. I don't have GPT-4 comparison here. But uh, what we are seeing here is we can actually learn our features are more state sensitive than uh, internet different features. And the improvement is much larger when you think about novel objects. When you take your model, you have not trained this state sensitive uh, so the, the way we do this is we learn our features and then to evaluate performance, we are going to train on a small number of supervised images to get these numbers. And you see a larger improvement when you're testing on normal object categories as opposed to ones that you've trained. And this is you know, kind of consistent with past uh, words and speech, right? So what we're able to learn here, what I'm showing is we can learn features which are more state sensitive this way than other approaches, right? So you can train for action classification that doesn't work. You can train on internet images which have been collected specifically for state classification. You can train models on that. They also, uh, what we are doing is better than it. Okay, good. So what I've shown you so far, hopefully, is that hands are useful, right? I've shown that you can use hands to predict affordances, which is where can I touch and how should I touch? I've also shown you that we can use hands to learn state sensitive features, right? Using this combination of temporal symmetry as well. But, at, but all along, hands have also been a nuisance. Because when I'm trying to learn affordances, there's a data mismatch. And I dealt with it by cropping out things. And as was pointed out, uh, that's not uh, the most direct way of doing this. 
So there is a problem in terms of the data that I'm training. If I talk about state sensitive features, I can learn features which are state sensitive over here, but then when I try to run it on a real robot, you have an embodiment gap, right? Uh, maybe I'm using uh, my robot interface to do something like this, which is different from what my app. So this whole enterprise kind of uh, uh, falls apart because of data distribution change. What have I told you that I can actually remove these hands and give you images which have separated out the hand from the environment? Would that not be more useful? And perhaps it will be, and I'll show you how. Right. So this is some uh, work in that space where we are building agent environment factor representations. Right. Given an image, the representation is I, I will separate out the hand and the environment. The way I'm going to do this is by training a segmentation model, which is simple, semantic simple, like set segmentation of hands in uh, scenes. I mean, one can collect data for it and it will work out. And I'm going to train a diffusion model, which can in paint the hand in these scenes, right? So it paint out the hand, right? So that's what we have done in this picture, right? Um, so this is the problem that we are going to tackle, right? So this is our actor representation. So what does it take to Build, uh, represent, uh, to, to build this kind of a model. The model needs to have strong priors. I need to be able to say behind this hand, there is a hand, right? But I know that there is a walk and there's a handle and you know maybe that will all work, right? Uh, but you can't just rely on priors. Sometimes you actually also need to pay attention to this, right? So if I'm trying to say what is behind these hands, uh, there is a background and there could be, there could be bananas or there could be oranges, I don't know. But if I look at it a little bit before in time, because I have illustrated videos, I can actually may have seen that there were oranges over here that are interested. Right? So we want a model which can leverage strong priors, but can also uh, leverage visual history in some way. And this kind of what we're doing, we are going to take a diffusion model that has been trained on a very large amount of single uh, frame data. So that's what we are using. And we are going to uh, we are going to adapt this model. To videos by using cross attention to draw on the distance. So that's kind of what we are doing. So this is what the model looks like. We have input images. We are going to add noise. Uh, it's a denoising uh, whatever unit uh, block that I'm showing over here. Uh, you take noisy input in with the hand mask that this is where you want to print out, and you're trying to predict uh, predict uh, the noise. Uh, we are going to. So this is a standard model that we that you can uh, take from the internet. We are going to add conditioning to previous frames. And the way the conditioning is done by is exclusively the attention block, and that lets you uh, uh, cross attention to draw on previous frames, right? So you get features for each of these individual frames, but then uh, by cross attention, you can let the model figure out what is similar in the previous frame, steal that information, and produce the uh, produce the input, right? So this is kind of what we're doing. So this is uh, how well it does compared to data diffusion. Uh, Finding on this particular data set, if you just look at single frames, it actually fails to complete. Uh, it does not put the uh, the right thing over there. Uh, DL Pomo was the state of the art on video diffusion, uh, video painting at the time when we were doing this work, uh, and this was uh, some predictions from uh, our model. And what you can see is we can leverage the strong priors in these diffusion models to speculate shapes of objects and uh, also uh, visual history to attempt to do things. Right. Okay, so here are some visualizations uh, just to convince you that uh, this actually does something quite reasonable. You can paint out uh, human hands. Uh, you can actually be using the same model to actually paint out the end effector uh, for the robot, and and it actually works quite well. Here is a video visualization uh, where you will see things floating around in air and uh, things happening. There's a little bit of flickering here because diffusion models tend to produce distributions, and you're not doing any temporal spooning over here, right? Uh, there is another one where this drawer opens automatically. This cutlery is hanging around. You can do it. Right? Okay. An example of objects is uh, putting. Uh, do you provide the previous generation as context also? So there's not a video model. We are just doing okay. frame by frame yeah. predictions. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think something like that would help with the consistency and the I think so. Yeah. Okay. We have played started playing around with some video diffusion models and they do much better at consistency than the single. Uh, okay, so here is uh, the robot end effect that we printed out and it was scarce. Now, how can we use this factor representation? Right. Uh, I talked about affordances in the previous part. 
you can take in the image, you can learn a function f to predict whatever aspect of the uh, of the interaction you want to predict, right? So if it were locations in the image, then I would just you know, say that okay, I want to predict a segmentation mass. So given this image, I want to predict the segmentation mass. So how this learning can be done with this factor representation? You can actually also use this factor representation to learn rewards from human data, right? So you can actually take videos, you can uh, you can you can try to predict the task progress. So the way I do this is, you know, I have a function which looks at the image and the agent. Now the, the two have been separated, right? So now I can, you know, more flexibility in kind of functions I use. Uh, I can, you know, have a function g, uh, which uh, right, so I can try to learn a reward function using the video data. I can actually run that reward function on the raw data. And I can make a different choice for G over here, right? I can choose G and G tilde to be functions such that they get mapped into a more invariant convergence. The choice that I'm going to make in the next few slides is I'm going to just represent the hands with a dot, which is that the, only the location of the hand is nothing else. Right. And similarly, you can take the end effector and you can convert it into a dot. Uh, and so that's an invariant representation, and you can do work. Uh, so this is what we tried. So we took epic kitchen videos of people opening doors where we did this stuff of you know removing the hand and so forth and uh, converting it into a dot you learn a robot function purely on epic kitchen videos and now you can start training a robot in the real world by using the learned robot function as a way to uh, 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 to interact with the scene right so in this case uh, uh, you can actually get this robot to open the door successfully i think what i'll point out is this plot on the right so this is Showing the sample efficiency of learning. How many samples did you need to gather in the real world to be able to learn this function? In the blue is so it's like four iterations, and I think each iteration was 20 samples or something, or five, something like that. So it's like a small number of trials. We are able to get good success rate, up to 80% success rate uh, using our method. And if you look at these two lines, these are base lines, which either don't uh, do this factorization, they use the raw image itself. And here, learning is slower because of the domain mismatch, right? You can't quite learn. Uh, I'm not even sure if this would have continued on. If I continued on, this would have learned. Uh, in the, in the uh, orange line here, you're seeing this past work, which also does in painting. It uses a ghost in painting. But more importantly, it does not do the agent environment factorization. They remove, they ignore the agent entirely. And ignoring the agent entirely for this task is problematic because you need to know that the agent has to go towards it. So that has to be represented in so the dot was used as a goal specification. The, the, the dot is supposed to mimic okay, where is the end effector in this? Okay. It's not so what we are doing is we are essentially predicting how far along the task I am. So you can think of it, yeah, am I 20% away, 40% away? But the dot is crucial to know how far in the task you are, particularly because you approach the draw in this case. And if you don't have a representation for where the end effector is, then and the uh, the extractor is also extracting information from both the hand and the uh, robot arm at the same time, right? Yes, yes. So, did you learn implicitly some correspondence between the two? No. So, uh, the way we are doing this, uh, the way we are painting out things is we are just feeding in black pixels over there. Right. We just remove the hand. Right. So then it's not it doesn't have any. So it's more focus on the back. How can I use the background to do this? Right. But I thought it's uh, information. The hand also is part of the pipeline. You have a G of the hand. Right? Yes. So is that G extracting some information about the hand or you know? No, so in this case actually it was a very simple instantiation where we were saying I'm going to replace the hand by just a 2D one. Oh, I see. So oh. it's not it, it's so in this case G is a hand graph. Oh, I see. Uh, and that's a good point. We could imagine uh, training a function G in some ways as well. Yeah, in this case we were hand graph. Like even maybe just extracting what is it actually graphing or you know, things yeah, like Yeah, yeah. So I think that's kind of what we want to do, and there's yeah. a reason why we have not done that. Okay. And I talk about that. So uh, on this slide, you are talking about learning the reward function, and then there is another layer of RL and stuff on top of. Yeah, that. yeah. So I so I'm going to learn the reward function on these clips, and this is where I'm doing RL with Gaussian filter method. So it's a zero hit shot, zero. Yeah. Uh, so you at least make the model of uh, like applications with human hands, and and also you directly like deploy on robot videos and farm That's what I'm doing. That's what we're doing. I just throws out of distribution. For this application, it does. For I mean, we, we we only tried it in the real world on one application. We have more results in the paper where we do related across tasks. So you can train on some application videos and you can use that learn reward function on other application videos. And by doing this factorization over there, you gain benefit. 
because different humans will be doing the task instead. Okay. But yeah, we have not tried many more real world examples yet. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing here is the reward functions are learned entirely on they are not learned in this environment, they are learned separately. Okay, good. So, you know, I, I told you how you can do this, but as was pointed out, I'm throwing away so much information, right? I'm throwing away information about the hand, about the object, and so on. Uh, right? So, can you do more? Can you incorporate more reasoning, right? That, okay, as I pointed out, the graph dictate of the hand and so forth. And that's exactly what we wanted to do, but we were not able to do because 3D hand code estimation in everyday egocentric images did not work out so well, right? So this is Frank Mukha, state of the art of Frank Mukha at the time. Uh, and, uh, and we were training models on, uh, I mean, if you, if you run that on Epic Kitchen videos, you don't get very good predictions, right? So in fact, you actually get somewhat flat hands. So in this case, the figures are curling to hold the bottle, but you don't get that curl in these pictures. You only get these hands straight. Over here, you are, again, the figures are curled around the object and you don't get that much, right? So this is the problem we were tackling. So let me tell you a little bit about Frank Mocap and very briefly tell you what we did to fix it. There are some nice things about Frank Mocap. It focuses on props. It, it takes, so what it does is it takes images, it takes props on hands, feeds it into a hand encoder, decoder to output the 3D. Right? This is all using 3D machine. We use manual parameterization for the hand and more. Right? It's trained on multiple data sets, but these are all that. Right? So this is what Frank Mocap does. It, it does something more. But I think it misses out some aspects which we are going to fix. It's suffering from ambiguity 3D pose, which arises from using props as images. And I'll talk more about that in this. And second, it actually does not generalize the device because it has not been trained on it. So this is some work, uh, 3D hand pose estimation and everyday use of images. And uh, I know it's quite late in the talk for a thought experiment, but uh, I'll present it. Here are some parallel pipettes which I'm showing you by keeping them in the center of the visuals, right? This is a cube, right? So this is a parallel pipette, which is orthogonal. And these are all different parallel pipettes, which are, you know, uh, twisting in different ways as we go for the visual, right? You'll all agree these are all different parallel pipettes, right? And I'm showing you the relative uh, 3D key point error between them. Okay, I think the assertion I'm going to make is I can cleverly place them in the visual field such that they will look indistinguishable. Right. So if I take this pattern of and I, you know, move it in the bottom right corner, you will see that different mode plotting will happen and it will actually start looking different. Right. Okay. Okay. Good. So this is, you know, uh, this is a ground and 3D. Now what I am doing, it, yes. Uh, <laughs> I made a mistake. My students will come back. No. <laughs> the, the, the fiction that the corner should not write. The vanishing point can never be. If the object is at the right corner, the vanishing point cannot be. There will be more like an airline projection, right? Or the vanishing point will be towards there. No, so it's not a cube. This is an arbitrary parallel. This is the parallel people. Oh, like the age, uh, age illusion. Yeah. yeah, okay, yes, yeah. yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do next is I'm going to train a neural network, which is what we do. We take a crop, we train a neural network to predict 3D problems. Now we have a problem. The same input goes into a neural network, but it is being asked to predict different things. This is a problem. You can train the neural network, it won't even train, right? So this is essentially if you use crop as input. Uh, but if you start um, using the crop plus crop location as input, crop location is denoting what kind of perspective this plot should I expect to have at this location. It works much better, right? Okay, good. We believe such an ambiguity also plagues 3D hand pose estimation. When you're training props as input, you take this prop as input, the front hand is in the top part of the figure view of the camera, even though it is flat, right? This is the two shape. The fingers are appearing for short and because of this. I could have the same hand in the bottom right corner, but if the fingers were straight, uh, which is, I mean, I mean the fingers would be bent and you get pretty low 2D key point error, but pretty high 3D key point error, right? So this is, uh, Perhaps at play, what we've done is, you know, you do the usual thing, which is you add information about the crop location. Turns out people in the past had done it, but not for this reason. So we adopt their solution. Uh, so it's just representing, you know, for each, so you have a crop, you can take the XY location for the crop, express it in the camera field of view, and feed that into the network. Um, and uh, and so we kind of fix this ambiguity in 3D crop issue. That's really beautiful. Uh, are you aware of the clique in human power? 
there was a paper that did only this and increased the accuracy, like we okay. can cut into the top of the leaderboard. Okay. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, I see. That uh, was like last year. A very simple correction. Uh, I see. For uh, for all the humans that are off the center. Okay. But usually people have done oh. the bounding box. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not, a, I mean, we tried looking for it. In the contact code, contact code, it's the very first. Not the, uh, not the encoding here. Uh -huh. Just the correction. Oh, I see. It's a it's a correction you can do off. Yeah, yeah. I see. But no, without training. Nothing. I see. I think the uh, yeah, so you could do a correction, but the correction will not work here, right? Because this right, okay. Uh, or the correction nature is going to be more complex. Okay, I'm not saying that I don't think you don't have a shape mode. You don't have a you don't have a shape mode. Like the no, actually we have a very dimensional parameter. So these are random people, which are three parameters. But but uh, I I like to look for that reference, I think. Thanks. Uh, okay, so this is uh, it does not generalize in the mind. That's a simpler uh, strategy. You do auxiliary supervision in real world data and and so forth. So this is kind of uh, uh, these are the results we get. We actually get the best results on the Arctic leaderboard. So wild handles are entry. You get uh, you do convolutional methods, you do transformer based methods, and so forth. Uh, here is another example on you know using both auxiliary supervision and this helps. We beat Frank Lucat quite a bit. Uh, here are some results on. Uh, what I was showing you before. We fix the curl of the finger, but not entirely, but quite a bit. Um, so that's good. Yes. Yeah, so the evaluation on that is very true and close. So it's all 2D annotation. So this is I'm reporting 2D and 2LF. Okay. So we annotated, we have a data set with uh, which we have to make it available 5,000 2D key points and key points. So we are measuring here the reprojection. Uh, yeah, so we get better hand post in interaction. Now uh, you may all be aware of Hammer, excellent work from uh, George Pogropos. Um, it's, it's, uh, so uh, I'm going to claim we are doing better than them. Uh, so, and I think for this uh, reason, so they are not modeling, uh, they're not modeling this 2D shape in there. What they assume is that the hand is directly in front of you and they want to predict the 3D which conforms to that. But if the hand goes to the side, that 3D that they have output, if you try to place it to the side, it will actually not match up by the analysis of the impact. Right. So if you do this evaluation, and you know, I'm interested in where the hand is in 3D, not like the root relative shape itself for me, right? So, uh, uh, so if you take the predictions, you place them where they are in the scene, and they have a recipe for doing this, and you 2D reproject, this is what you I mean. This is what you get when you're looking at a front post uh, dead center, and this is when you actually take the hand and place it on the side. So even though when they're training using a VNT backbone, training on very large amounts of data, uh, they get worse error than us training this with Resident 50 with, uh, with this trick to, to, to take care of it. Okay. All right. Um, I guess um, I could also talk about 3D reconstruction of objects in hands, but I'm going to skip that in interest of time and try to conclude the talk. Um, so, what I've shown you hopefully is that learning a different types of structure is uh, useful. I showed you examples, and you know, we can do things with. Uh, we can learn things from navigation, so uh, subroutines and affordances. We can learn value functions or dense reward functions, uh, use them for decision making. Uh, and I also showed you uh, how we can learn common sense about objects and, uh, and scenes by watching how hands interact with objects in the world. Right? I also, towards the end, uh, talk about more on how we how can do better human behavior analysis. In some ways, I think I talked about this agent environment factorization, which is useful for learning policies. I talked about how can you extract 3D hands from uh, uh, from images, um, and I guess I did not talk about uh, 3D handle object construction. But in some ways, what I'm arguing is for manipulation. I think the problem is harder. You need to actually understand what I mean, hypothesis is. You need to understand what's happening in the scene, and that you can get by using using uh, understanding hands and object construction. So that's some work along this human behavior analysis. Uh, I like to mention I also uh, work on uh, proper behavior generation. So we had some recent work on whole body mobile manipulation, where we had this stretch robot going around, and now it's you know it's cool to call it zero shot. It's it's never seen uh, any. It has no experience with this particular drop, and it's actually able to open this uh, uh, quite gracefully. And it's a whole body manu a mobile manipulation problem. The reason this problem is interesting and hard is because there's a tight constraint that the end effector has to follow, and they're using predictive optimization to actually output these very fast, much better than typical motion planners do. So we are doing full body mobile manipulation over here. 
We are also doing work on navigation in threatened environments. So these are robots in the beloved cornfields of uh, Illinois. Mm -hmm. These uh, robots can drive around for miles at end. Uh, robots, uh, you know, why would I like to have a robot that can hike? I would like to hike myself. <laughs> Having a robot that can do Monday tasks in concrete. Um, we are also working on manipulation of the formable objects. Uh, in this case, again, like, uh, you know, manipulating, uh, moving around leaves in order to see behind them, etc. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. This is all the things <laughs> of gender work uh, and funding agencies. I'll keep some points up for discussion. I'll take questions in this. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, good. Um, for questions. Let me start. Yeah, so how do you specify some of the constraints or goal you want to, you know, have the robot to do? Right now, I think we'll get goal to a point or something, right? How do you specify that? Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, so uh, that's a good question. I think what I showed you right now for manipulation tasks is uh, more like, a, uh, more like pre-training for it or like a good starting point. And then task specific learning happens a little bit later. We have some work on using videos also to specify tasks. We have a single demonstration, and now you're trying to get a robot to do the same thing under perturbations of objects and such. Um, yeah, but we are not tackling, I think that itself is a good problem. Is how can you specify tasks in a general way for us? I'll bite on point four actually. Um, okay. Yes. And what, you are, yeah. Yeah. What what will you uh yeah what yeah. Are the yeah, I, I so I, I think I think videos are not going to take us all the way. I think that's my first realization. I think uh, uh they're only providing a kinematic observation, you're not observing forces. Certain tasks might or the all about forces, like having a nail in the in the wall, right? Largely, the motion can be correct, but ineffective if you're not modeling that. Okay, I have to apply force. I can stop right at mm -hmm. the head of the nail, right? So that's a limitation. And um, but I think maybe there's still a role that you can learn about this. You at least know to hit on the nail and not on the wall. So maybe that's a start. But uh, yeah. yeah, it won't it won't get us on. Yeah, the same. Uh, uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, and uh, the same line, uh, I mean, when you pull, uh, I, I don't think uh, we could put a lot of attention on accelerations and like triangular moment. For example, when you pull a heavy drawer, you can see from the acceleration in the video how much. Uh, yeah, you pull it natural, right? Not uh, like uh, like like to figure out. Uh, Physical properties of the world using, yeah, yeah that's a very good point. We're not good. Uh, regarding the points, there are now data to be kind of used, and that I think would be like a, a, a one for 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 one the ground will be in the wild, but it can also be used for boxing. I see. Uh, also, Yanji, uh, you and both colleagues can uh, uh, add a nice video uh, uh, captured. Yeah. Uh, in the kitchen, there's this person. So the post, none of course, plays for dancing. Oh, I see. I see. Yes. Okay. Uh, but I think there is still something on observing. Right. Oh, I see. Have, so if we have some minimal supervision of them, Yes, yes, yes. That's a good point. I think the yeah question would be at what frame rate do you need this information at and such. I mean, is there a limitation in terms of that you? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but uh, I think that maybe one if you want that we do a manifesto of this, I would uh, call it. I would number one. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically for tennis. <laughs> Is Mark in the audience? Not in the audience. To defend language. <laughs> I, I mean, safe <laughs> Okay. Wow. I think uh, it's a deep set of questions, so I think it's uh, not easy to answer in such short time. So let's thank uh, Sarah again for a great talk. <laughs>